Hi. In this video I'll demonstrate an early model of the Comdyna GP6 analog computer. This is the latest addition to my lab. I picked this unit up uh, three or four weeks ago. It's got a couple of interesting features uh, that made me want to get a hold of this one. It's a, a very early model so it's got a Nixie tube display for the digital voltmeter instead of the LED display with the more modern units. Another interesting thing is it included a diode function generator. We'll take a quick look at that. The diode function generator is a device for performing a function of a variable other than time. In the analog computer a typical function will be a function of time but in some cases you'll need to run one of the system variables through a, a nonlinear function that can't easily be generated uh, with the internal components of the analog computer. So that's where the diode function generator comes in. I'll demonstrate the diode function generator in a later video. That is assuming it works. I haven't had a chance to test this out yet, but uh, it'll be a fairly interesting addition for uh, some analog computations. Now we'll go back and take a look at the analog computer itself. In the analog computer right now I've just got a basic test program set up to test the computer. I've got a fairly simple program set up that I'll talk about in a later video, but it's basically an undamped uh, spring mass system if you want to think of it that way. The nice thing about this, although this is a fairly easy problem to solve and wouldn't necessarily require a computer to solve the actual differential equation. It's actually useful in analog computers because it gives you a way to generate the sine and cosine function. So here on amplifier 1 I've got a cosine function. You can see that starts at positive 1 and has the typical uh, cosine shape. And then on channel 2 I've got a sine function. It's actually an inverse sine function because it the typical sine function starts out going positive, uh, but this starts out going negative. And then I've got the same thing on channels uh, 3 and 4. And then on amplifier 5 and 6, that uh, switch is a little flaky, I've just got a, uh, bring up the intensity of the scope a little bit, I've just got a fixed voltage plugged into those to demonstrate uh, the Nixie tubes and the fact that the uh, amplifier is working. Same thing on uh, channel 6 there. And then I've also got a, an inverted version of both of the sine functions there on amplifier 7 and 8. So that the interesting thing is the all of the functionality of the computer works. This uh, computer was manufactured probably right around 1970, uh, at least according to the date codes on some of the ICs. I see a 7038, which I'm assuming is uh, the 38th week of 1970, so the computer was likely manufactured shortly after that date. The serial number is 103, and from the, what I've read about the history of the Comdyna GP6, I'm assuming that was the 103rd unit. I think they started the serial numbers at 1 because uh, I've read an article uh, by a Mr. Ray Spice, who was the inventor and uh, I guess the owner of the company that manufactured the Comdyna GP6. And he said he started uh, shipping units in October of 68. So that would be in line with being up to about 100 units uh, by 1970. Uh, this computer, of course, being as old as it is, is not without its problems. It, it runs me, uh, very well considering it's nearly 50 years old. Uh, the few problems I've seen so far are uh, a cracked, the cracked insulation on the line cord. Uh, I did have to replace the knob on that. Uh, switch selector switch there and also that selector switch is very difficult to move and you probably noticed as I was switching the uh, amplifier select switch there are some flaky spots on there so I think those are easily uh, remedied so 
Uh, that's uh, in fairly good shape considering uh, its age. There are not a whole lot of differences from the front of this compared to the newer models. If you've seen any of my other videos, you've seen me demonstrate a fairly late model. I think the other model I use is from the early 90s. Uh, there was actually an article in the June 2005 issue of IEEE Control Systems magazine, uh, which was actually authored by Ray Spice. I, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's uh, S. P-I-E-S-S, -S, so I'm not 100% sure of the pronunciation, but uh, Mr. Spice said over the years uh, nothing really changed much in the operation of the unit, but there were a lot of changes internally, uh, mainly being uh, more and more circuitry was eliminated, so the box became more and more empty over the years, and you'll see this box is uh, fairly full of circuitry now. Uh, one of the key differences, uh, I guess in the, in the later models, there was a switch added here uh, for repetitive operation mode. And in this model, that would actually be selected via the uh, mode selection switch. Uh, so right now, it's actually running in repetitive operation mode. There's a minor change to the banana jacks here in the later model, uh, the summing uh, Summing junction jacks are gray to differentiate those from the inputs to the amplifier. That's pretty minor. And then, of course, the Nixie tube display, it doesn't show up very well uh, on the video there, but that's a fairly nice, kind of interesting feature of the unit back in the 70s. This was fairly common to use the uh, tube based Nixie tube displays. I may try to get a close up of that later. The Nixie tubes are actually a gas-filled tube with separate numerals for each of the uh, digit displays. I actually looked into those a little bit recently, and I, I read, for what it's worth, the term Nixie tube came from one of the early designators, was NIX, standing for, I believe it was Numerical Indicator Experimental or something to that effect, so uh, that became Nixie tube and that became the term for those in the industry. So that was an interesting feature that uh, made me interested in getting this. It's kind of interesting that it sort of uh, covers the range of time from the tube days to the integrated circuit days because it uses integrated circuit operational amplifiers in the electronics but yet it's using tubes for the display. So interesting bridge of technologies there. Here I thought I'd take a close-up look at the Nixie tubes. You can see the individual uh, numerical elements inside the Nixie tubes themselves. So I'll turn up the uh, potentiometer 5 slowly and you can see as the numbers change the individual elements light up And you can kind of see the, if you look closely, the numbers that are on the top are kind of in silhouette back there. But overall, the display looks pretty good because the uh, you're mainly you know just interested in the character that happens to be lit at the time. So that's a kind of interesting uh, display technique. run it all the way up to the uh, full voltage there. And it peaks right at uh, 1.000 which is a factor of 10 of the uh, input voltage and that pot I've actually got set to uh, the positive input, but we're looking at it after an inverting uh, amplifier, so it's reading negative 1.00 corresponding to the positive 10 volts on the input to the amplifier. So that's a quick look at the actual Nixie tubes themselves. There are also uh, these potentiometers down here that are no longer there on the newer models. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what the purpose of those are, I and mean, they're not covered in any of the 
literature I've seen, so it's going to take some investigation to determine uh, what the purpose of those are. The electronics, I'll, we'll take a look under the hood here in a minute, uh, but the electronics are quite a bit more complicated. Uh, I think mainly because as better ICs came around, it was easier to simplify uh, a lot of the circuits there. So I think that covers all the differences between the older Comdyna GP6 and this particular model. Uh, so now let's take a look under the hood. It's fairly convenient on these units. We can uh, simply swing down the uh, front panel here once these screws are removed. And then I'll put a little support here so the uh, cables aren't taking up the stress there. You can see a little bit of the inside of the unit there. It's uh, with, at this angle. It's uh, a little hard to see, but uh, let me take a uh, bring in a little more lighting. Maybe we can see a little better what's inside there. Uh, with the light, you can see a little better. Uh, the depth of focus here is not great, so uh, we'll have to live with that. But uh, as you can more clearly see, the tubes. <laughs> as uh, for the Dixie tube display now and uh, it's a little tricky to see but you can see behind each tube is a vertical PC board that uh, from this angle I can see that's roughly say two and a half inches by four inches uh, so there are a total of five of those boards and behind the uh, Nixie tube display circuits is a power supply dedicated to the Nixie tubes and I'm assuming that's a high voltage supply uh, because the Nixie tubes require a, a higher voltage than is typical. Uh, and then the five boards and the Nixie tubes all plug into a main board that is that horizontal board up on the riser back there. Uh, the interesting thing about the newer model is all of that is condensed down to a circuit board with one voltmeter integrated circuit that drives uh, seven segment LED displays and that entire circuit can mount right here on the front panel uh, right behind the uh, window for the display there so that's quite a reduction right there in the overall circuitry. Uh, towards the middle there is the main uh, power supply back in the back uh, of the box there and then to be honest I'm not sure what the circuitry is in this stack here I'm gonna have to dig into that a little bit uh, this yellow component right here is a large uh, capacitor so that likely has something to do with the integrator circuitries uh, I know in the newer model there are uh, large integrating capacitors and there's another board down below that hidden from view that has uh, four of those large capacitors. So those are likely for the uh, four integrator amplifiers uh, that are available through the uh, front panel programming panel there. Uh, I'm going to have to dig a little bit to figure out exactly what all of the circuits are on the uh, uh, main board there. There's a common chip. Uh, across the board which uh, I looked on the web and the manufacturer symbol on there is Teledyne. It is marked 810CN like Charlie Nancy uh, but I was unable to find any information on the internet yet uh, regarding that chip. I'm assuming it's an early op amp, uh, you know, circa 1970 but uh, I haven't been able to come across a data sheet for that yet. Uh, Teledyne, it's interesting, was, uh, I'm not sure if they acquired or was formed from the original uh, Philbrick uh, company. I, I can't remember the exact uh, name of Mr. Philbrick right now, but uh, there was a uh, company, actually, <laughs> to come to think of it, I got it right here, Philbrick Research Inc Incorporated, I've got a little uh, Philbrick early uh, modular differential uh, 
operational amplifier there, and they later became Teledyne and manufactured integrated circuit uh, operational amplifiers. So it looks like the uh, Teledyne uh, op amps were used in this device. So that's a little more of the carrying on the history of the uh, analog computing technology. It's interesting, there are four daughter boards here, 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 and here that are all identical. So I'm assuming they have something to do with the uh, operational amplifiers accessible through the front panel. Uh, again, I, I've not seen any uh, literature on this particular computer, uh, so it's going to be a little tricky to figure out the circuitry there, but I may set that up as a long-term goal. So that's about it for this tour of the uh, Comdyna GP6, uh, circa 1970. I have some plans for restoration of this. I've got short-term plans. Of course, I'll replace the power cord. That should be, well, relatively easy. Unfortunately, it's buried in the back, so I'll have to disassemble quite a bit of the unit just to get in there and get access to it, but it's a fairly straightforward task. And then, of course, I'll hit all the switches and potentiometers with some contact cleaner, see if I can uh, clean up a lot of that noise. Uh, and then I need to identify those Nixie tubes. I found, you know, there are quite a few Nixie tubes still out there available, uh, what they refer to as new old stock. So uh, they were manufactured back in the, you know, 60s and 70s probably, but are never, never been used because the technology went away so abruptly. Uh, but I just need to pull those out and uh, identify them and see if I can get some... Uh, replacement units and have a few spares on hand. Uh, they seem to be lasting fairly well and I haven't seen any issues with them. So uh, there may, you know, may not really need those, but I just want to have some backups for those uh, in case any of these ever go out on me. And as a longer term plan, I may sit down and uh, dig through the circuits and try to create a block diagram and then go even further and create some schematics for these uh, boards so I can know what I'm working with. I think most of the circuits are fairly straightforward, uh, so that should be uh, relatively straightforward to create a schematic for those. And once I understand what all the sub-circuits are, I'll try to go through and do a complete calibration. It does seem to be fairly well calibrated. The power supply seem to go right to uh, zero and, or sorry, minus 10 and plus 10 volts but I haven't really taken a hard look at any of the amplifier circuits. They, they're functioning, but I'm not sure how accurately they're functioning. So let me put the unit back together. We'll take a quick look at the front of it again. So here's the unit buttoned up again. I'll uh, you know show we've got the, uh, as I mentioned, I've got the sine cosine generator function uh, dialed in. And an interesting thing is with this, we can take a look at the uh, phase diagram and if I put the, I guess that is the sine on channel 2 and the cosine on channel 1, we can generate the elliptical or circular uh, Lissajou pattern. So that's an interesting uh, use of this once you get into more complicated uh, differential equations. We can look at the phase diagram and learn more about the differential equation. So I'll leave it there. You'll see more of this Comdyna GP6 as I continue to make videos. I hope you enjoyed that, and thank you for watching.